Author Armistead Mopan is known for his acclaimed series Tales of the City that started as a serialized fiction story in the San Francisco Chronicle. Since then, it's been adapted about 12 times, but the most recent adaptation on Netflix dropped last Friday. It's also called Tales of the City. We watched the pilot episode, and we're letting you know all of our thoughts here on TV Pilot Reviews. You're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to TV Pilot Reviews here on AfterBuzz TV. We are so excited to have you here today because, as I mentioned, we are talking about Netflix's brand new miniseries, Armistad Maupin's Tales of the City. I hope I'm saying his name right. I'm saying it as if I'm a fancy Frenchman, Tara. Yeah, I'm, I don't even go for saying the name. I'm just Tales of the City. Just Tales of the City, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, based on the name, I kind of assumed it was going to be some kind of like YA fantasy show or something. I felt like it was going to be a British thing. Yeah, it feels <laughs> Mama very Armistead Mopan. It feels very, yes. very British, but it's actually very distinctly American. I yes, would say. very much so. Um, takes place in San Francisco. Before we get more into the show, guys, let's quickly introduce ourselves. You're hearing the lovely voice mm-hmm. of the brilliant Tara Erickson. <laughs> hey, guys. I'm Tara Erickson, and I'm happy to be here breaking her down. Breaking her down. Tara, are you allowed to say what you were doing? Oh, yeah. Well, I was not here. I was absent because I am uh, the number one lead in a Lifetime movie. I don't think I can say the name yet, but it's got like a horror thing going on and I play a mom uh, and some stuff goes down oh, and so it excited. was I'm very excited and very happy to be a part and we just wrapped a couple days ago and I'm back well, it's huge, and we're very excited for you. It's very well thanks. deserved. Um, and my name is Jeff Graham, guys. Thank you for tuning in. It's great to be here today. I'm excited to talk about this show. Before we dive into our coverage, I'm going to quickly let you know kind of what the show looks like. We will be giving you our overall thoughts in a general sense first, and then kind of giving you the development history on the show, because it's very interesting and rich with this show. We'll talk a bit about the cast, and then we will go into a spoiler section for the show. So my general rule of thumb with this show is the longer you listen, the more stuff you're going to find out about the show. (laughs) Yeah. So if you don't want to be spoiled, you know, hang around until that spoiler warning, and then you might want to dip out. Uh, but for those of you who have seen it, we will be getting into specifics later. Okay. Terry Erickson. Yeah. What were your overall thoughts? I really liked it. But also, Laura Lenny's in it. I adore her. I think mm-hmm. anything with her, she's just, she's brilliant. Um, there was, uh, what I wrote down is there's a lot of colors of the rainbow in this show. Mm. And there was some times when I got not completely lost. I still knew what was going on, but I I tuned out a little bit where I was like, this is a lot of information that they're trying to like, just here are all the colors of the world. And you're like, yeah, I know I get it, but like slow down a second. But I still really did enjoy it. And I'm really glad of like what it's bringing to light of LGBTQ community and like gender fluidity and all of that stuff. It's very like 2019. I agree. I, I agree with everything you just said. And I forgot to mention guys quickly, this show is kind of a contemporary look at LGBTQA life in San Francisco is kind of the general way I would describe the show. Yeah. Um, it basically focuses on Laura Linney's uh, character, re-coming back to her home, visiting all of the people she used to have a community with, mm-hmm. and that's kind of really where the show starts. I agree with some of what you said. I thought in some ways this pilot was a little clumsy. Not in ways that it was, not in representational ways. It's funny, you watch some shows that are clumsy with the way they handle gender queer or gender mm-hmm. non-binary, and the show felt very well-researched in that component. It was more clumsy from a storytelling perspective and the way it managed this huge ensemble. This is definitely an ensemble show. I'd say there's at least eight to nine main characters and I don't know if I left the show feeling like I had a very strong sense of who all of them were besides sort of what their orientations were Mm -hmm. in the as you mentioned in the rainbow yeah it's Um, like throwing a lot of colors out there throwing a lot of colors out there and I think I'd prefer that the colors felt a bit more vivid after this episode is the way I would describe it but at the same time the performances are solid Mm -hmm. I think if you're into sort of slow moving character dramedies that are interested in representation, you will like this show. It looks great. It's well acted. I just think I wish there was a little bit more narrative thrust in this episode. Yeah, I got a little bored in certain yeah. moments where I was like, I'm kind of uh, not really truly engaged. And that was that was odd for me because it's a stellar cast. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you look at the names, and like people faces keep popping up and I'm like, these people are great. But and I couldn't figure it out, whether it was in the directing or the editing, maybe it could have been faster paced that way. Yeah. But I do think it's probably more of a narrative structure problem. Yeah, there just wasn't much of a story here aside mm-hmm. from someone coming home. And that's OK. This sometimes happens with Netflix shows. You know, it's kind of that 
that slow burn 10 episode it feels like a movie type mm-hmm. of thing which personally whenever I hear it's like a 10 episode movie I want to run for the hills and hide in a bunker because <laughs> in my opinion a great TV show can feel both like a 10 hour movie but also with distinct episodes yes I think Stranger Things does that really well yes oh my god it's so weird I was like I literally in my brain was like Stranger Things the mm-hmm. pilot episode yeah. was like here are all these people here are all their points of view we know who they are and I cannot wait to click next right exactly I think in this episode it felt a bit like I was watching one tenth of a film Mm -hmm. whereas I would have loved to not only feel that way but also feel like I got a complete arc in the episode which that's not quite as in vogue as it used to be in television which is maybe something I have to get over but (laughs) you might have to get we might both have to get over it we might both have to get over it but I applaud the episode for its earnest and clearly well researched views into representation and it seems like the show has a lot of empathy for all of its characters yeah I agree and I I mean there's some well, there's some kickbacks, some lines that like they they have in here, some quotes, but I won't I won't ruin it now. That that are like seem like the protagonist, Laura Linney. They're really trying to give her a lot of lines to be like she's kind of a person that we can relate to if you're not in the LGBTQ community, mm-hmm. but um, that she also fights for their rights in certain ways when she's welcomed back home. For sure, if she's not exactly woke, she's at least waking up. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, at this point in the show, we're going to quickly discuss the cast. Uh, the two main leads who I feel like the show is kind of being built around are mm-hmm. Laura Linney and Ellen Page. Very, very interestingly, Laura Linney's actually reprising this role. So she, isn't that crazy? Wait, Wait, was she in the 1993 yes, one? Yes, and she played uh, Marianne what? Singleton. What? So this is like kind of an unofficial sequel, which is crazy. Wow, that's insane. That mm-hmm. I wish I would have watched the 1990. I, I only know. read about it. I didn't watch it, and I wish I would have watched it. Well, we'll be getting into there are so many adaptations of this mm-hmm. project, but Laura Linney's been involved with a ton of them, which is really interesting. I so, love that. And she is an EP on the show. Nope, no, she's not. Oh, yes, she is. She is an EP on the show, okay. which makes sense. So yeah. you get it, Laura Linney. Get um, at it. I like this throwback photo of Laura Linney. Oh, my Great. God. Great. For those of you guys watching on the YouTube, we do have some cast photos, and our incredible producer, Ryan, is really on it in the booth. So thank you, Ryan. Mm. Um, fun to see Ellen Page as well, playing yeah. her queer daughter. Ellen Page has really slid nicely into that witty sort of lesbian like role yeah. in a great way. And she still like has that like deadpan humor, which I love. Yes. Like she's stuck to her guns and like this is kind of who I am and this is how I play roles. Uh and I love it. She's also great. just killing the Netflix game. Yeah. Because she was just in the Umbrella Academy. Yes, the Umbrella. I was like, look at her. She Netflix is loving Ellen Page, as are we. Uh we have Paul Gross who plays Laura Linney's um now husband Mm -hmm. in sort of an uppity white haired man role um ryan's pulling up a photo now good we've seen him around it was nice to see him Um, you mean you mean her the husband that she raised with she raised shauna with actually the husband she raised shauna with is Is the other guy uh Oh, you might be right. Yeah, because that's her ex-husband. The white-haired guy's her ex-husband. Thank you. Um, who calls her Baby Cakes, which I was like, what is that nickname? Okay, wait a minute. Isn't it Mouse that's calling her Baby Cakes? Which is her gay best friend. What? Real? Was it? I think it might be... Uh, Michael? <laughs> Michael Bartlett, who's playing Mouse, who calls her Baby Cakes. Oh, okay, because I thought it was her... I thought it was her ex for a second, and I was like, wow, Baby yeah. Cakes. That's intense. Her ex just mostly... Um, Angrily walks out of the room. That was pretty much his okay. MO this episode. <laughs> it's all good. Do they as, both have white hair? I think I'm losing my mind, of, you guys. A lot of salt and pepper. Okay. A lot of handsome yes. Jack salt and pepper men in this oh, show, huh? Or as they, to honor the LGBT community, a lot of daddies in this show, right? A lot That's of daddies. Yeah. And um, Michael is the cradle robber, right? Yes. Thank you so much. Now we've cleared that up and I'm on board. Yeah. So, and we'll talk about his boyfriend who's yes. played by Charlie. Bartnett as Ben Marshall and a nice breakout performance from him. So, um, you know, as you guys can see, this is a huge cast. We're just (laughs) going to go through it in that capacity, but fun to see everyone in this show. And again, fun to see them honoring all the colors of the rainbow, as you said. Oh, and Olympia Dukakis, we forgot to mention. She's like huge. Yeah. So interestingly, Olympia Dukakis is kind of the um, umbrella that holds the whole book series together. So the book series kind of revolves around her. She's like the den mother of this sort of apartment complex where everyone lives. Yeah. I mean, I got that from the TV show. I have not ri- read, written, 
read the books, didn't write them either. I wrote the eighth one. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> Congrats, yeah. Jeff. I share co-writing credit with Armistead Mopa. <laughs> uh, but speaking of, let's talk a little bit about the development history of this show. So the first novel came out in 1973, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. And he's been writing this cycle of books for the last three, four decades. The most recent book just came out in 2014. And from what I had gathered, it looks like that ninth book is going to be the last of the series, which is disappointing, huh? Do they all take place in the same location Mm -hmm. in San Francisco in the, okay. 28 Bartlett Street, I think is what they call it. Wow. Um, And it's cool. It's these, just this whole uh, umbrella of characters that interact and live their lives. Yeah. I mean, there's, there seems to be a lot of material there. If you lived there, you could write nine books. Absolutely. Yes. So it was also adapted for radio between 2013 and 2017 by BBC Radio 4. Each one of the books individually. Oh, okay. That's like a radio drama. Wow. Also, the first book was adapted for PBS in 1993, starring Laura Linney as this protagonist. PBS knows how to do it. Interestingly, though, it was very controversial when it came out because it had like nudity and sex and drugs, which isn't typical fare for PBS. Mm -mm. Um, Showtime adapted the second and third installments, I think kind of under the same production company banner. It just moved channels with Laura Linney still reprising that role. Wow. So she's played this in now four separate television projects. I bet you Showtime really, really dug into it, though, realistically. (laughs) Moved further away from PBS land. I bet. Um, And now Netflix is doing this, and I've kind of gathered, and for those of you guys who have read the book series, you might be able to speak to this a little bit more eloquently, but I've gathered that this is sort of a departure from the books, and it's more of a sequel set in the world of the show. Yeah, which would make sense to me. I, I don't I don't I feel like there's gonna be people commenting that like they read all the books, but like this show doesn't <laughs> doesn't prove it. Exactly. Um, yeah, it, we'll see. Well, it feels thing, very current. It feels very current and you know, it's I think in the original books they were primarily dealing with uh, sort of a I, Tara's gonna pull up our chat. I'll look at I'll look at the it. chat, see if you guys um, are if anybody's read the books. Yeah. Or even if you're not in the chat and you are in the comments, let us know if you've read the books. Yeah. Speaking of, we want to take this moment to just really quickly say thank you to you guys and just let you know how much we love when you guys chat with us, be it in the live chat or in the comments. Um, it really helps our network. I mean, Tara, you've hosted here. It's That's a cool part of what we do, right? Yes. The audience engagement. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's great when you guys actually comment, say what you want us to talk about, or when you guys have way more information than us because you've read all nine books. That's <laughs> amazing. Exactly. Uh, it makes our job a little bit more fun to get, uh, you know, to tips from you guys. Exactly. And a way that you guys can make our job a little bit more easy is by hopping on iTunes right now and giving us those five stars in the podcast rating on iTunes. If you guys give us those five stars, a couple things. First of all, we will read your review on air and we will shout out your name. What? What? We will also say thank you because what you guys are doing in that case is bolstering our podcast and putting it higher in the search algorithms on iTunes. And, you know, we do this for free, guys. We do this because we love television just like you. We're like a missional network that just wants to nerd out with all of our TV (laughs) fans. And you can help us do that if you rate us on iTunes. So, um... We really appreciate it if you guys would do that. Yeah, get with your fellow entertainment junkies and like, follow, all that stuff. Exactly. Um, in terms of who's behind this iteration of the show, it's developed and show ran by Lauren Morielli, who worked in the writers' room of Orange is the New Black. Oh. Not super all right. surprising, right? Yeah, no. When you look at the same sort of queer themed ensemble show. Right. That's really what Orange is doing. And she's also Samir Wiley's wife, which I never realized. Who really? plays um oh, I didn't know that. on Orange is the New Black. So Yeah. Love that. I love that they're having a um queer showrunner run the show. Yeah. And actually the entire room is filled with queer writers. There's no like straight cis writers in the oh, room. Oh no so, way. Yeah, it's interesting. If you want to read up on the show, there was a lot done um the writer, the showrunner, Lauren Morielli, was saying that she really had to reach out and dig because even though she put out that notice to agents and managers, everyone was still insistent of just they kept sending in writers that didn't fit the criteria. So mm-hmm. kind of an inexperienced room, but that sort of creates, I think, an interesting tone for the show. Yeah. I love it. First-hand experience is better. Absolutely. Um, so, guys, that's our non-spoiler take on the show. I feel like you've, we've kind of given you a flavor of what the show is. Mm-hmm. And at this point, we will be getting into spoilers. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Okay. Tara. Yeah. 
Let's get into some specifics. Okay. Um, I know you were saying how you felt about the show in a general sense, but anything sort of specifically stand out to you now that we can, uh, now that the floodgates have been opened? Um, I mean, I wrote down that Olympia Dukakis' character is, is quote, City Anna. I mean, <laughs> she, like, you watch the show and every other sentence from Anna, who is played by Olympia Dukakis, is a quote. It's just a poignant quote that is very quotable. Quote, quote, quote. I totally agree, and I think that's one of the issues I'm kind of having with this show, uh-huh. if I'm being honest, is in terms of representation and casting, it's very revolutionary, mm-hmm. but in terms of storytelling, it's kind of conventional, right? Yeah, Like, we yeah. have the wise old sage who speaks in parables, and we have the wife coming home, and here's my question. If this show weren't as interestingly cast and represented, mm-hmm. would it be good? Um, I don't think I would have lasted past this if Laura, Lenny, and Ellen Page were not in it. There is something about their chemistry when they're finally at the roof mm-hmm. in this episode where they go to meet and, you know, Ellen Page is like, you're my mom, but you laugh type deal. Um, that you're you're really interested in, like, why is Ellen Page acting this way? Like, she's kind of acting like a bro to her mom. Um but the way that it's played with Laura Lenny and Ellen, I'm just like super engaged and I want to watch them. If it was done by anybody else, I don't I don't know that I would care so much. The rest of the characters, I wasn't fully engaged. Even the part where um, I forget her name, she goes to do a dance with uh, in the room and does like a mm, sexy dance. I've got and it. And that's supposed to be a poignant, uh, I think like a poignant moment of like, oh, this is how we do it. We do kind of like what we want, San Francisco freedom, which is great. Uh, I didn't realize, I didn't get the point of the scene that it it didn't really seem to like move a story along. It just was like a scene, we're going to have it to show what it's like in San Francisco and to be like queer and hang out in this community. I agree. I think the show is sort of um, very much like a tone show. Like it feels like it's relying on feelings and sort of vague conversations to communicate what the feel of this community is. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see more of a story here. I do feel like at the end of the episode with that twist, we got something. Yes. Did that hook you? It did. I was like, wait, what does that mean? (laughs) Uh, That was the one part that I was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to watch another one because I want to, I don't want to just guess as to why it's like, you're a fraud, but I'm like, in what way? Yeah. Uh Yeah, my only issue with that, though, is I get a little frustrated when I feel like I'm waiting around for something to happen. Yeah. And then something finally happens, and it's like, did that have to do with anything I just watched for the last 50 minutes? But Probably not. They were like, I don't know if this is going to hook anybody. Let's add this singer in there. Yeah, it felt a bit like a network note. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, from the top. Yeah, from from the top. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe I'm just wanting to this show to be something it isn't, you know? Yeah, I I, I have a feeling that if, if in episode two when I watch it, I'm not getting, I'm getting the same feeling that I did in episode one, I, I probably will not continue to watch mm-hmm. the show because it just didn't there's time is limited and I want to watch a show that I really am into. Right. And right now I'm like, Oh, that was interesting, you know, towards the end. And I, I do like the, some of the characters, but, um, yeah, I feel like they're kind of pushing the limits on a lot of these guys and trying to add in, I don't know, a lot of thoughts and feelings into one episode, but it just not really moving anywhere. It's just like that one person's feelings and the way that they operate in this community, but it's not, all coming together. That would be my argument too. I, it's interesting. I, I almost felt like, in a way, this show, even though it's so contemporary, feels a bit dated in a weird way. Yeah. I can't necessarily put my finger on it, but I think if this show had aired five years ago, it would feel totally radical. Mm-hmm. But as of late, there has been an increasing amount of queer representation yes. on TV. So, you know, it's not like you're necessarily... I don't know if you deserve my applause just because there's a trans character on your show anymore. And I I need there to be also a compelling narrative reason for me to tune in. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping in these continued episodes they really focus on telling us a story rather than just sort of painting a world for us. Yeah. I also hope we get more quotes. I mean, I loved the one where... <laughs> At the very top, the way that they set up this episode is we're still people, aren't we? Flawed, narcissistic, and doing our best. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, yeah, we totally are. Cool. And then it just it keeps like she keeps quoting a bunch of stuff, which I I still like, but it's like thrown in there without linking it all together. Like we must allow people the room to surprise us. Literals are for the unimaginative, which is all great. But you're like, yeah, but I, I wish that that quote came at a point where you were like, 
yes! And they they didn't. And it's also interesting because I feel like one of the objectives of this show is to create a very realistic, lived-in world. Mm -hmm. And people don't necessarily talk like that, right? Like, that's more of a heightened... And, you know, Aaron Sorkin writes this way, but Mm -hmm. we don't watch Aaron Sorkin projects to feel like we're in the real world. We feel like we want to enter Aaron Sorkin's world. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I felt like I was seeing these really naturalistic conversations, and sometimes the character would say something like, these days it's all about burying your feelings behind a wall of sarcasm and snark. Yeah! And it's just tough. I, I I don't know if I believe people necessarily talk that way. Right. I didn't believe it's the same where she's like, "Did you you needed a break from the emotional upheaval of reminiscing?" Where I'm like, "God, oh, that's a great line. Yeah, totally. We all need a break from like if you reminisce and you're like, oh, it's too much." I get it, but I don't know that it was it was really like how Shauna's character I don't know is gonna talk or be for the. It just didn't seem to fit exactly. Yeah, I just, those two things were pushing up against each other, I think, which is like the lived in, naturalistic, intimate, sort of cozy world they wanted to show us with this kind of heightened, I don't know, a show that does do that pretty well is Gilmore Girls. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you were a fan of that show. So it can be done, but I feel like even with Gilmore Girls, Stars Hollow is supposed to sort of feel like a fantasy land a little bit. Yeah. And I felt like they were trying to convince us that 28 Burberry Lane, Barbary Lane, is supposed to feel like it could be my next door neighbors or something. Yeah, and it's not as fast paced as I think it maybe could have been. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, it's the pacing is odd to me. In my opinion, it's kind of like a slow start, and then they you you feel like they maybe want to go into Gilmore Land or Aaron Sorkin Land with these quotes and they try to pick up the pacing a little bit but then they like really linger in these slow Mm -hmm. moments that i um i don't i don't know they just kind of just like lego blocks putting them together but without a uh but what are we building right yeah i don't i don't think they know yet yeah and i'm I'm, you know it's a 10 episode season so there's more to come but yeah the discussion we often have of is your responsibility as a pilot to set the stage or is it to start telling the story we have this discussion a lot on the show and i don't know there was a lot about this episode that i really liked though i feel like we're being Mm -hmm. a little hard on it right now i know yeah we are (laughs) um what i did love was the way it was shot i thought it was gorgeously shot um, I also thought it was really well scored. I loved the soundtrack. Yeah, me too. Catchy, catchy tunes. Catchy tunes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and the way that the apartment looks with the twinkle lights in all of those shots, mm. they're beautiful. They make you want to watch the show just because of that. It, it is very beautiful the way it's shot. Yeah, I appreciate a lot of times with sort of socially conscious shows, there can be an element of darkness or, may, dare I say, like pushy edginess that can sometimes almost demand sorrow or demand that you hurt in mm-hmm. order to enjoy the show. But what I appreciate about this was they managed to um, sort of promote a socially positive and progressive message while still kind of giving us comfort food TV. Like this still kind of felt like a cozy blanket or like a bowl of chicken noodle soup and still kind of mixed in with a socially conscious message. I agree, because there's still some hard moments in there of, mm-hmm. like, Laura Lenny and her marriage is, like, a down the tubes. And it's like, she's thanking her husband for coming with her to our family event, you know? And, like, that's kind of a sad moment, as well as finding out Shauna, like, hasn't had her mom. She's only grown up with her dad, and her mom shows up. There's all these weird, darker moments mm-hmm. that are supposed to be that, I think, maybe make you feel a little bit more. Um, but it still was kind of in that TV land where you were like, oh, this is kind of a lot, but it's not not like too much. It didn't feel forced. They just felt like this is how we want to tell the story. Absolutely. Not like that they were like, we need to tell it this way because that's how TV does it. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those things where there's always television shows that you feel like you should watch, but you don't necessarily want to watch because you know it's going to be hard to watch. Mm-hmm. And what I appreciate about this was on paper, I might read this just knowing sort of the, the messages behind it. That's a show I should watch. Mm-hmm. But the way they presented the message makes it also a show I could want to watch as well. So yeah. it's a nice intersection of those two things, I think. I agree. Anything else specifically about the show before we dive into some of our last segments? Mm, no, just, you know, there's a cradle robber in here, mm. which I wrote down. Yes. Uh, he's not really. I just, I like their relationship. I'm like, he's like a hot dad and he's got like a hot young boyfriend. And Definitely. I find that that relationship very entertaining. Well, I have to credit the performers who we shouted mm-hmm. out early in the episode because there's real chemistry in that relationship. Yes, and... that's, I like believe in that relationship. Yeah. Like, I'm like, this is so. Those two are so interesting to watch. Yeah, to me. I agree. I love it. Definitely. And you, you know that there were screen tests with other actors mm-hmm. where you're like, why is this father hitting on his son? Yeah, yeah. But and with them, it works. Yeah. I wonder if it's an interracial relationship as well. And I mm-hmm. wonder if that sort of helps 
you know, distance us from... Right, from, like, yeah, a relation or something. Because yeah, you, you might think, like, as an exec of, like, if he's also white, people right. might, like, say yeah. certain things. So, uh, it's yeah. It's working. I, it's working. Yeah. I, I enjoy them as a couple a lot. I also want to quickly shout out, I loved Girls when it was on TV. I don't know if you watched that yes, show. Yes, of course. We got Shoshana in this yes, episode. Yes, we do. Oh, Zajim my God. That, so. With her, all of her eyeliner, too. I know. Very different from Shosh yes. in this episode. Um, okay, cool. Well, at this point, we are going to do a couple more segments. The first one we're going to do is rate the pilot out of five. Oh. I'm giving this a 3.2. Ooh, that's a good rating. Um, yeah, man. Okay, the pilot. I- I'll go a little bit. I'll do 3.5. Great. A little more. I yeah, love it. a little more. Uh, but let us know what you guys saw in the comments. Even if you're just commenting with your rating on the pilot, we'd be curious to hear what you think. Yeah, let us know. Somebody said, definitely want to see this again after all these years. So yeah. maybe, maybe Restrick, you haven't seen this yet, but uh, see it. Let us know, you know, in the comments later what you think. How it compares, I'd love to hear. Yeah. Last thing we do is sort of talk about if you like X show, you'll also like Y show. Oh. So... For me, as I mentioned, the showrunner comes from Orange is the New Black. I think this is a similarly empathetic ensemble type of show. Mm -hmm. Wasn't surprised to learn that. And I think also if you're into sort of the HBO half-hour dramedies, I think of a show like Looking, which I didn't actually watch, but maybe I'm small-mindedly presuming they're similar because they're both LGBT-oriented shows. Right. Um, there's a show I loved that not many people watched called Togetherness that was created by the Duplass brothers. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of what they're doing... That was a great show. I loved Now it just popped show. in my brain, and I was actually very sad when it ended. So was I. Amanda Peet was in that show. Oh, she's great. Um, I actually got to interview Jay Duplass a couple years ago, <gasps> and he said they might do a movie of Togetherness. Ah, so. That show is so good, you guys. Yes. So good. Um, any suggestions for other shows that you can think of? I don't know. If you really like Laura Linney, I mean, the big mm-hmm. C, she She's like does such a wonderful job. Yeah. The the main reason why I really was excited about the show is simply because of her. And the, the Ozark is is great as well. Uh she's just she's a really good lead, even if the material is not a great narrative. I think however she moves and grooves in a character, um, I just believe her always. She's always compelling. She is. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Any final thoughts before we make our way out of here, Tara Erickson? Uh, I don't think I have any, except I'm going to watch the second episode, and then uh, I'll see see what happens from there. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, with that, we're going to make our way out of here. But we thank you so much for tuning in to TV Pilot Reviews. Again, today we covered the fourth television adaptation of Armistad Mopan's <laughs> Tales of the City. Ooh, that was a good, good, good try there. A good try. Well, I did my best. Uh, if you guys want to find me on Twitter, you can do that at Jeffrey C. Graham. You can tweet me there to let me know what you thought of the show. Also, if you're interested, the small cross section of sort of the intellectual elite who tunes into this show, I also cover The Bachelorette here at the network. Woo, woo. And I love that show with no shame. And you can watch me on Mondays at six, uh, 7 p.m. covering that show on our reality channel. I love it. I am Tara Erickson. You guys can find me on YouTube.com forward slash T-A-R-A-E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N. Tweet at me, ter- at, the, at the Tara Erickson Instagram, the, uh, sorry, Tara Erickson. Just Google. You guys know how the internet works. <laughs> and I'll see you guys soon. Absolutely. We'll see you guys next Wednesday at 5 p.m. here on TV Pilot Reviews. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. 